We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, which is, I was going to say it's a tricky chapter. It's not a tricky chapter, but it is a, it's a meaty chapter. And often when, often when we approach scripture, we kind of go, what, what am I going, what's going on in my life right now? How can I find some scripture to help me speak to my life right now? And that's valuable, and that's good, and, and we want to be able to engage the scriptures in this kind of way, because the Bible does speak to us today in the everyday minutiae of life from the seemingly unimportant to the very big decisions of life. Um, but also, the Bible is, like the, the way that we tend to approach the scriptures is we want to be in the Bible, uh, I mean, daily. And for us as a church community, we gather together weekly to gather on the scriptures. And we tend to go through whole books of the Bible. Like we're in 1 Corinthians 5 today. We started at the very first verse and we just go verse by verse through whole books of the Bible, not expecting that this chapter is necessarily going to speak to me today, although often it does. But that we build our life on the foundation of the scriptures. We'd be conforming our lives to the scriptures so that when the time comes when the thing that we learned three years ago, uh, when, that, when that time comes in our lives, we aren't surprised. So when Jesus talks about, when he promises us suffering, for example, and when Paul tells us that we share in Jesus' inheritance so long as we share in his suffering, so when suffering does inevitably come, we're not surprised and we know how to faithfully go through suffering. For example, we're not talking about suffering today, or well, necessarily. <clears throat> uh, for, for our family, in the Redden household, all of our kids are learning how to fight. And we hope they never have to fight. Uh, that's, that would be the ideal. Uh, but there's no use in when a fight comes to you, all of a sudden going, okay, I have 10 seconds now to learn how to defend myself or somebody else. But rather, building a foundation so that if that time comes, we hope and pray that it doesn't, uh, they are equipped to do it. And again, this is how we want to approach the scriptures. So we're building our life on the scriptures so that when the time, like next week we're going to be looking at lawsuits. Now I hope that you never have to be in a lawsuit, for example, or, or never have to take someone to court to be in that position. But if you are, next week is going to be very helpful. But what we don't want to do is go, next week's about lawsuits. <clears throat> That's not really applicable to me right now. I'm just not going to bother learning about that. But again, rather, we want to be building our life on the scriptures. The week after that is about relationships and, and marriages in particular. And if you're not married or you have been married and never intend to get married again, uh, you never intend to get married, or if you already are married, you might go, well, that's, that doesn't apply to me. Again, rather, we want to think, well, how do we ourselves build our lives on the foundation of scripture, not just for us, but like we looked at for the last month, so that we can also pour our lives and our learning into other people so that we're there for others. So again, in two weeks' time, where you've been married happily, or, or you, again, you're not married, never intend to be married, or whatever combination uh, applies to you, that you'll also be thinking, not just for me, but how can I help those younger people around me, perhaps, or people who are going through these kinds of things? All that to say, uh, some of the specific examples from today's scripture, I don't expect will ever feature in the life of our church. At least I hope. But others absolutely will and have in the past. So as I, as I read through this, uh, please don't think, oh, this doesn't apply to me, or oh, that sounds really, really harsh, or too hard. I'm going to just put that to the side. That somebody else can think about these kinds of things. I don't need to think about these kinds of things. But rather, we would build our life on all of the scriptures. All right, have I built it up enough? Well, let's get stuck into 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'll read it for you. This is what Paul writes. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And the kind of sexual immorality that's not even tolerated among the Gentiles, a man is sleeping with his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Shouldn't you be filled with grief and removed from your congregation, the one who did this? <clears throat> even though I'm absent in the body, I'm, I am present in spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I've already pronounced judgment on the one who has been doing such a thing. When you're assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I'm with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, hand that one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. For visiting with us today, welcome to City Light Church. 
<clears throat> uh, your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole batch of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new unleavened batch, as indeed you are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us observe the feast, not with old leaven or with the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in a letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not mean the immoral people of this world or the greedy or swindlers or idolaters. Otherwise, you'd have to leave the world. But actually, I wrote you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister and is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, verbally abusive, a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such a person. For what business is it of mine to judge outsiders? Don't you judge those who are inside? God judges outsiders. Remove the evil person from among you. I told you it's a hard chapter. Let's ask the Lord for help and get stuck into it. <clears throat> and so again, Father, we need your help. As always, we need your help. For the things that seem easy to us, for the things that seem difficult to us, for the things that come naturally to us, and the things that seem very counter-cultural, please, Father, help us. We want to want to worship you in spirit and truth with our words and with our lives. We want to become just like Jesus. And so would you help us in Jesus' name? Amen. <clears throat> so like we've seen before, even though this is 1 Corinthians, this is not the first letter that Paul has written to the Corinthians. He's obviously written to them before because he says here, I wrote to you before not to hang out with sexually immoral people. He says, but... Oh, but just to clarify, uh, I wasn't saying don't hang out with uh, anybody who is engaging in things that we would call unholy. So I didn't say you couldn't hang out with people who are greedy or, or swindlers or drunkards or people who are sexually immoral. Otherwise, there'd be nobody left to hang out with. So that, that's not what I'm talking about. He's, he's creating a distinction. He's saying there are people in the family of God who claim Jesus who are waving the banner of salvation, who are saying, I represent Jesus in the world. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. I'm claiming him. And there are people who don't claim him. And people who don't claim Jesus, he says, what? Why, would, why are we judging those people? How can we expect people who, are, who don't have the Holy Spirit to act in a way that you who have the Holy Spirit still struggle to act. How can we expect people who are not in the community of God, who don't have the Holy Scriptures, who don't have the Holy Spirit, who haven't been saved, who haven't been made a new creation, how can we, how can we put expectations on them to live a holy life when you who are already holy are struggling to live a holy life? Because we don't judge outsiders. We don't judge them. People who don't claim Jesus, we don't look down on them from a position of moral superiority or from a moral high horse as if we have somehow, by our own effort, pulled us up, ourselves up by our bootstraps and achieved a level of righteousness that would enable us to look down on others. For saying that's not us. We're not those people. We are the saved by grace people. It says, but people who are inside the church, for people who are brother, who claim the title of brother or sister, he says, isn't it these people who you are to judge? So says, we don't judge people outside the church, but there is a sense in which we together, not you from your moral superiority, but we together are to judge one another. That's what, he, that's what Paul writes. What he's not talking about is, is blasting people. <clears throat> he's talking about discernment. And so he says, uh, don't judge a person who doesn't belong to Jesus, but we, there is a level of judging. Or, or, there's something that we have to do. So let, let's have a look at what that is. Uh, we are to judge those who claim to be brothers and sisters, claim to be united with Christ, who claim to be filled with the Spirit. So what we don't want to do is judge our kind of modern ideas of what Judging is. We don't want to touch our modern ideas of what judging is, which might be some sort of like there's connotations of kind of a gossipy, condescending, 
superiority. Um, it's not that kind of judging. That's what he's talking about. When we, in, in 2024 in Australia, when someone says, oh, you're so judgmental or you're too judgy, that's different, I want to put to you, than what Paul is talking about here. What Paul's talking about is, we want to understand it as a discernment that leads to an action. When Paul says, we don't judge outsiders, but we do judge brothers and sisters, he's talking about a discernment that leads to action. There is a discernment amongst each other that leads to a particular kind of activity. That's what he's talking about. And what is it that he's wanting the Corinthian church and wanting us to discern? It's our Christ-likeness. He's saying, if you are claiming union with Jesus, you're saying that you have Jesus, and that you are his disciples, you are like him, and you're becoming like him, but then what you do with your life is not like him. And Paul says, even, even those who don't have the Holy Spirit look at what you're doing and say, oh, that is, that is not okay. Paul to the Galatians, and he says this, he, these are the works of the flesh. He says they're obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, faction, envy, drunkenness, carousing, anything similar. He says this is not an exhaustive list. He says these kinds of things. The, the, the kind of life that doesn't have self-control, the kind of life that just gratifies my own fleshly desires, the kind of life that is not in God's order, but is disordered, out of order. So as I warn you about these things, as I warned you before, those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. He said, we are people who belong to Jesus, called to live for him, made a new creation, given a new heart, given a new nature, given the Holy Spirit to enable us to live this kind of life. He says, we don't go back to slavery to sin. He's calling out the same kinds of things in the Corinthian church. He talks about the sexually immoral. He talks about the greedy, the idolater, the verbally abusive, the drunkard, and the swindler. How were they acting like this? Why were they acting like this? Paul, he doesn't use the same kind of language that he uses with the Galatians, where he says, you're going back into slavery. Why are you doing that? Trying to, trying to be made righteous with, with, um, with your activity, but your activity sucks. Rather, he's saying, actually, that you guys are even arrogant. You're boasting in your sin. How? How? We looked at this last chapter. They weren't just like sneaking about. They weren't trying to project an image of holiness on the one hand, and then behind closed doors, they were going about a different thing. No, they were bringing their sin out into the light. They were going, isn't this amazing? We can sin all we like, and God forgives us. We can do whatever we want, and God still forgives us. And so there's this kind of element of truth in there, but horrendously misapplied. Where well, Paul's basically saying to them, you have, oh, you've totally misunderstood grace. You don't get grace. He writes to the, Rome, to the Romans, says, grace is, um, this is my paraphrase, grace is amazing. Grace is wonderful. Grace is phenomenal. Where sin abounds, where there is sin, grace abounds even more. Where you keep sinning, grace overcomes your sin. There's, there's more grace than there is your sin. Because grace is phenomenal. Grace is wonderful. Grace is Amazing. Then he goes on and says, so then do we just keep sinning so that we can see more and more grace? We love grace. Grace is phenomenal. When we do sin, God's grace is there and doesn't just match our sin, it overwhelms us. It's phenomenal. But we don't then just go, well, let's sin as much as we can so that we can see more and more of God's grace. He says, hell no. We don't do this. The Corinthian church were living in license. They were presuming upon God's grace. They're like, we can do whatever we want. And God has to forgive us because Jesus. One of them even sleeping with his stepmom. Again, the thing that the people in the culture around them were looking at and go, 
how could you do such a, a horrific thing? And I'd say, because we belong to Jesus. What we don't want to do is arrogantly revel in our sin because it's forgiven. That's not the point of grace. The point of grace isn't to go, we can do whatever we want. Paul does say in the very next chapter, we'll see this next week, he says, I can do whatever I want. He says, but not everything's helpful. He says, I can do whatever I want. And, and in, in some translations, this is in quotations, where, where we think he's quoting the Corinthians. He said, I can do whatever I want. So he's quoting the Corinthians saying, like you, I can do whatever I want, but not everything's helpful. I can do everything, I can do anything I want. Anything is permissible and not everything is actually going to build me up. Not everything is for my good. Not everything is going to give God glory. And we've got to understand grace properly so we don't get this wrong. What he doesn't say is, check out these guys having an affair. How awesome is this? Go, go have the affair. It's wonderful because God's grace covers it all. Let's just go get drunk all the time because God's grace covers it all. Let's swindle people and steal because God's grace covers it all. But this is how some in the Corinthian church were living. They're celebrating it. There's, there's what's his face. Look how horrifically he speaks to his wife. How harshly he treats her. This is one of the things Paul is specifically calling out. And I say, well, grace, grace. Grace. And again, there's, a, there's this element of truth where, yeah, that, the most horrific and heinous evil of sin is totally washed away in terms of Jesus already taking the punishment for that sin. God not holding that sin against the person who did it. But man, there are still consequences of sin. There are, there are implications and ramifications. We don't just do what we want so the grace may abound. There's much, much more to it than this. Which is why Paul writes, rather than being arrogant and presumptive upon God's grace, he says, rather, we grieve our sin. Where there's grace, we celebrate the grace, but we also grieve the fact that that grace has come at the cost of the Holy One of Heaven. We grieve the fact that we haven't lived in a way that's pleasing to God. Not to earn his love. You have his love. But that we've taken his love and trampled on it by going and living to gratify our flesh. Our sin is what made it necessary for Jesus to come and die. And our, our, winful, our willful ongoing sin separates us from the life of victory that God wants for us in many kinds of ways. And again, we'll look at this in more detail next week. It says it's not just for the individual. It says recognizing in the church community, in the Christian family, in the family of Jesus, it says when we <clears throat> recognize a brother or sister who is, again, waving the banner of Jesus, claiming to be a brother or sister, but then willfully, Paul says, arrogantly going on in sin. It says when we play cute with that sin or turn a blind eye or sweep it under the rug or say it doesn't really matter, bro or sister. When we do these kinds of things, we become like the arrogant Corinthians in our sin. And it does, it does something to us. In fact, it does many things. Here are some of them. It makes us liars about who God is. Because we are in, in a kind of prophetic sense with our lives and our actions, we're saying God doesn't care about sin. And we, with our witness, do damage to God's holiness. Not, we don't actually like materially do damage to his holiness, but in our witness we do. We say God doesn't really care about holiness. And God is not really holy. And God does not actually have... <laughs> he, he hasn't really done anything. Jesus' sacrifice wasn't really that meaningful. We lie about the nature of God and what he's done. When rather he's made us a chosen people, a royal priesthood. He's made us holy. He has set us apart. He has taken us from death to life. From 
darkness to light. And when we say, well, it doesn't really matter. We'll just go back to darkness. We're lying about who he is. He's made us spotless and blameless and pure and holy. Washed with the precious blood of Jesus. And so we, we necessarily take sin seriously. It, again, it weakens our witness also. <clears throat> We're not supposed to be a mirror reflecting the culture around us. That's what the Corinthians were becoming like, a mirror reflecting the culture around them. So people would look into the church and say, they're just like us. Or in some cases, they're worse than us. And not only are they worse than us, they are yelling down from their moral high horse, telling us how evil we are. And then when we pull back the curtain, they're just as evil. And we hear over and over and over again, high profile Christians who are doing heinous and evil things behind closed doors. They're, sure, they're projecting the image of holiness, projecting the image of goodness. They're not actually living that way. That, that might be a distinction from the Corinthian church. But then there are others that just willfully, whole denominations that have just willfully become like the culture around them and said, God doesn't care about holiness. Just some warm and fuzzy modern interpretation of what I think love is. That's all that God is. He's just love, not holy, not wrathful, not set apart, not otherly, no justice other than my brand of justice. And we lie about who God is and we do damage to our witness. We say the gospel doesn't really matter. or We reflect back to the world just what the world's already got. And they say, why, why, should I, why should I care what you have to say? Rather than a mirror, we need to be that prophetic window into what the world would look like under God's righteous rule and reign. What does order look like? God's divine order. What does it look like? Come and look at our community. Come and look at the family of God. This is... This is actually what we should be saying to others. Not preaching from a moral high horse, judging outsiders, but rather to come and see what God has done. Thirdly, it's idolatry. It values something or someone higher than God. It disregards the character of God, disregards the nature of God, disregards the command of God. This regards the call and the invitation of God. Come and live. I've made you holy. Come and live as holy ones. And rather we say, well, now we've made holy, we're going to go live how we want to live. Because we've, we've sealed that salvation. Now we can do whatever we want. Paul says, that's, that's idolatry. That actually, again, that shows the world. Shows everyone looking in the church and out of the church, you don't, actually value God above everything. You value what you want above God. And you use God to get what you want. Thank you, God, for that salvation. And I'll pray to God for the thing that I want, but then I'm going to go do the thing that I want. I don't mean to keep pointing to Derek as I'm preaching. This just, it's just that way, you know? <laughs> it doesn't help the person who's sinning for us to turn a blind eye or to go, it doesn't really matter, or play cute with it. Or sweep it under the rug. It doesn't help them. It may be nice if nice is kind of this veneer of unity because we don't argue because we never talk about the real things. But it's certainly not kind to let somebody willfully continue in sin without, like, as Paul's going to say, stepping in and saying, my brother or my sister, please stop walking the path of destruction. doesn't help the church as it makes sin palatable and less offensive to God than it really is. So churches tend to drift like one degree at a time. Churches don't tend to say, you know, we're, we're running hard after God and um, great theology, great 
practice and great gospel community, and then all of a sudden, you know, right angle over here, and we're going to chase something foolish or stupid or evil. We're either one degree at a time, one, well, we, we won't look at that, sin, don't care about that, I'm going to ignore that, and then over and over and over again, one degree at a time, month after month, year after year, just like discipleship is a process that we measure in months and years, we don't get frustrated as we make small progress in our discipleship and Christ-likeness. It works the other way as well. When we are careless with the person and work of Jesus and his holiness desired and, and pursued as a church community. And again, whole denominations have been one degree at a time, have ended up at a place where they still wave the flag, like they still claim to be a brother or a sister, but they are so, so far from anything that meaningfully looks like a follower of Jesus. Redefined entire words around their own meaning so that it bears no resemblance to how the scriptures talk about them, if they regard the scriptures at all. And Paul says, man, these are, he gives dire warnings to these kinds of people who slided to unfruitfulness, unfruitfulness and unfaithfulness. But he also helps us. God helps us here. How do we respond to sin in the family? Again, we're going to judge outsiders. We are to discern that leads to action with our brothers and our sisters. Out of love. Again, not from a moral, place of moral superiority, but from a place of love, affection, brotherly and sisterly love that would propel us to not, not ignore sin, not run from sin, but to step into those situations, to say, please be reconciled to Christ. How do we do it? He tells us, we run to the unsaved with the gospel. We run to them. We eat with them, we greet them, we love them. He says, we don't judge outsiders. So I didn't tell you not to eat with outsiders. I didn't tell you not to eat with sexually immoral. I didn't tell you not to eat with the, the greedy or the drunkards or the swindlers or the idolaters. There'd be nobody left. You'd eat with nobody. He says, no, go eat with them. Go be with them. Just like Jesus went to seek and save that which was lost, he's given us the same mission. Let's go to those people. Love them. Show them what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus. Tell them what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. What about the brother or sister, the professing brother or sister who revels in sin? Note he is assuming that they have been confronted or that sin has been rebuked or that they've employed that Matthew 18, gone to the brother or sister in sin or like Paul writes uh, to uh, the Galatians and the Thessalonians, I think. He says, man, if, if someone's caught in sin, go to them and Restore them in a spirit of gentleness and respect, but watch out, lest you two fall into the same kinds of sin. So he's assuming that we are going to those people and lovingly sitting down with them and saying, I don't, I don't condemn you. I'm not coming from a position of moral superiority. I'm coming from, I'm also a fellow beneficiary of the wonderful grace of God. If he treated me according to my actions, I would be under his righteous wrath. But because he, to me, like to you, has extended his grace and his mercy and his love and his forgiveness, we have been washed clean. Our sin has been dealt with on the cross of Christ. Every stain has been removed. All guilt and shame has been dealt with. Not coming from a, a, a position of moral superiority, but a brother and a sister, and I say to you, abandon the sin that is pulling you away from God. Be reconciled to Jesus. He says, if they continue in their sin, he says, don't eat with them. Don't greet them. Saying, we can't continue to treat them as part of the body of Christ when they are doing damage to the body of Christ. It's a hard word because for us, in 2024, <clears throat> we, like to, we, we 
like to apply our understanding back into Scripture and say, that's mean. That's unkind. It sounds better to me. It sounds more reasonable to me that if I was, if I was around them more, if we were treating them more like family, that then they would say, oh, I'm going to abandon my foolishness and pursue Jesus. So how do we practically do this? How do we, how do we not eat with someone, not greet someone, but still love them? He doesn't say not, not to love them. Remember, in, in all of his other letters, the goal is reconciliation. The goal is restoration. The goal is that they would abandon their sin and run to Jesus, flee their fleshly gratification and run to Jesus who loves them. So what does it mean to not eat with them, not greet them? Uh, Paul's saying to, to put them out. He even says, man, when we gather together, we hand them over to the adversary in the flesh. So even if their flesh is dealt with, even if they go and die, that their spirit will still be saved. Always his goal is that they be reconciled to Jesus. It is, a, it is a primary in, uh, importance. And so putting them out of the family is a physical, physical representation of a spiritual reality. They were not pretending. They want to say, well, it doesn't matter how you live. God doesn't care what you do. But rather that God does care. We're not walking with Jesus, but you claim Jesus. Again, God, uh, Paul, is, Paul is kind of categorizing these people, saying he's not talking about outside. It says, welcome them in. Welcome those people in, the people who claim Jesus but are living in a way contrary to Jesus. Can't continue to call them family. And hand them over to the deceiver. For what purpose? Not to condemn them, condemn them, not because we're better than them, not because we are righteous in our own you know, self satisfaction but because in obedience to Scripture, they, they would be saved. It's a hard word. Again, Jesus talks about this kind of um, discernment that leads to activity. Matthew 18 says, If your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault. Retain you in him. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. If you won't listen, take one or two others with you so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. If he doesn't pay attention to them, tell the church. If he doesn't pay attention to the church, let him be like a Gentile and a tax collector to you. That's, against someone, that's for someone who has sinned against you specifically. And how, where does it end? It ends with treat them like a Gentile or a tax collector, someone who's not in the family of God. How does Jesus say that we should treat Gentiles and tax collectors? Uh, that we'd love them and we would present the gospel to them. It's not an abandonment. It's not a cussing out and a get lost. We don't care about you anymore and you're out of the family and never speak to you again. It's a, again, a material representation of a spiritual reality so that they would understand I am outside the body of Christ. And so that we would communicate to them, come and be reconciled to Jesus. We've, we've gone through this process before at Light. Where you a young guy who claimed Jesus? Uh, who's baptized here, actually? Claimed Jesus, baptized here. And there came a point where his lifestyle was, became evident. It was so anti, so disordered, so anti the kind of life that Jesus wants for us. Uh, it was, again, doing damage to the body, damage to his and our witness. And the process, in, even in the discipleship group, where even his brother then, like biological brother, went to him and said, hey man, uh, we love you, but we can't, you're not in the body. And we're through this kind of process and, and put him out of the church. And for a couple of months, he embraced that kind of destructive life and at one stage, kind of, you know, prodigal son style, came to his senses and went, this, this, what am I doing with my life? And was 
at the time, I've like, been really wonderfully and gloriously reconciled to Jesus and to his brothers and sisters in the church family. I'm not saying every situation is going to end up as you know, quickly resolved or as well as that. What I'm saying is we want to be a people who are obedient to Scripture in how we go about being a family. And again, our goal is not to shun the unbeliever. Our goal is to welcome the unbeliever. Welcome everybody into our family. We think we've got the greatest news. Again, we, we are all about grace. We, we don't deserve it. We haven't earned it. It's not something that we have, you know, we, we say this often, we don't go away, get our lives in order, come back to Jesus and say, we did it. But rather, we come to him empty-handed and say, we can't do it. And he gifts us salvation, gifts us grace, and gifts us the faith with which to receive his grace. It's wonderful. Paul uses the analogy of yeast to illustrate how tolerating sin can affect the entire community. He says, when, he says, when you want unleavened bread, flat bread, you add a little bit of yeast, bang, that thing rises. He says, you need to cut out the bit that's been infected with the yeast. Again, it sounds really harsh, but it's for the ultimate reconciliation and good of the person being cut out. So that unchecked sin doesn't spread and corrupt the whole church. Paul urges the Corinthians. He says, we've got to take sin seriously for each individual, for you personally, for us as the family of Jesus and for the sake of our mission. We've got to do it. Not just for the guy sleeping with his stepmom. He says, for the sexually immoral, for the greedy, for the idolater, for the, for the verbally abusive, for the drunkard, for the swindler. He's catching a lot, of, a lot of us. If he kept going, he'd get us all, right? You see, the things we play cute with, or we go, oh, it doesn't really matter. Or I'm only doing it behind closed doors. And what he's not saying is the person who, you know, has been sexually immoral but has repented. He's not talking about that person. He's not talking about the person who got drunk but isn't a drunkard. He's not talking about the person who said a harsh, harsh word, repented of the harsh word, and that's not a part of their character of life. He's talking about the people who, like in Corinth, were saying, I can do what I want. Or somehow try to balance some karmic scales. Well, sure, I'm verbally abusive, but I'm not greedy, and I'm, and I'm not sleeping around. Or, or I've never swindled, swindled anybody. Uh, you know, sure, I get drunk quite often, but uh, at least I'm not verbally abusive when I'm drunk. So no, no, there's, there's no comic scales here. I'm certainly not saying that they're not, they're not sin, right? I'm not saying, well, you know, you got drunk or you were sexually immoral or whatever. You know, that Jesus died for those things. I'm saying rather we grieve our sin. We say, man, I, Lord, I'm sorry that Jesus had to die for that sin, for my foolishness and rebellion. And do we, we can still revel in grace without reveling in sin because God's grace already applied to you. Should we never sin again in our lives is wonderful enough, wonderful enough for, us, for us to sing about forever and us to, us to worship him about forever. When we sin, God's grace covers all of it. It's wonderful. The grace that saves us is also the grace that changes us. And so the Corinthian church loved the salvation of Jesus. They did not love the lordship of Jesus. But the grace that doesn't change us doesn't save us. And Jesus is only the saviour for those he's also the lord of. And so we want Jesus to be our saviour and our Lord. We want that grace that saves us and then propels us to love and to good works. Not because our holiness makes God love us, but because God loves you and has made you holy in Jesus. So you are holy. You're, you've been set apart. You have been made perfect. 
You are the blameless, spotless, holy ones of Jesus. And so Jesus and Paul and the Spirit now echoes to us, come and live as holy ones. Don't play cute with sin. Do the loving thing in love. Walk to the brother or sister in sin and say, please be reconciled to Jesus. And the weird community would be open for a brother or sister to come to us and say, hey, brother, hey, sister, I see this sin in your life. And that we wouldn't arc up, we wouldn't lean into our pride or arrogance and say, how dare you? Or you too? Or what about the, you know, the speck in your eye or any of those kinds of things? We would say, I want to be holy. I, w- I want to live as holy as I, as I am in Jesus. And we would thank correction. Uh, thank the one who corrected us, I should say. Welcome correction. Okay, I know this has been a hard word. We're going to deal more with it in our discipleship groups. My hope is that for us as a community, yeah, we, we would together, we'd be pursuing holiness, spurring one another on to love and to good works, not playing cute with our sin, not saying, well, it doesn't matter because grace covers it. We say, man, we want to be just like Jesus. We want to be just like Jesus. Let's pray. And so, Father, we do. We want to be just like Jesus. Help us to live as the holy ones you've made us. We are the great beneficiaries of your wonderful love and grace. And, and Father, we want that. We want to be the people who's, who, for whom your love and grace changes us, directs us, shape us and mold us into the likeness of your son. Help us to conform to the things we see in scripture, the, your character, your nature, and your commands. Help us to not play cute with sin in our own life. And Father, help us to love one another so much that we would step in and boldly say, with all humility, be reconciled to Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.